Hi everyone, this is Matthew Brewer here, a registered marriage and family therapist uh, that is in downtown San Francisco, and I focus on bipolar and other mood disorders, and I'm currently accepting clients, and I make these videos to help educate and entertain um, people within that community. So today I thought we could talk about Gestalt as a perceptual field of study within psychology, as well as how those principles have been applied to psychotherapy. So stay tuned. So a lot of the Gestalt research has been done on visual perception. And I, like usual, have some handouts that I used for the group that I do. And I will also post that link here. But uh, first off is some different terms that Gestalt uses, and I'll get that just a little bit closer so you can see it. Uh, let's start with proximity, and that how even though those are just blobs of ink on a page, being grouped together, our eye and our brain interprets and perceives them as together. Um, that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts is something that Gestalt talks about a lot. And then the next one, when objects are look similar to each other, we kind of group them and perceive them as some sort of pattern, whereas if they look different, our brain sees them as more separate. Uh, continuance is how the eye sees kind of uh, this continuous um, form, even though it's just a blank space. And closure is somewhat similar, where most often, you know, you could focus on the uh, different little Pac-Man right there, or you can see that there's kind of a triangle and that our brain tries to complete that incomplete gestalt. Um, this also really brings one of the primary concepts of figure and ground. Um, so depending on where you focus, you can either see, you know, the black box in the middle or kind of like the white space around it, and that things are constantly falling in and out of focus or attention. And that is kind of like the preliminary crossover into applying this as a psychotherapy, that we find those things that are flooding the foreground and figure out what's fallen to the background and kind of bring some more fluidity and flexibility to that awareness and that attention. So just to give a few more examples here, it's kind of fun. Um, looking at all these different patterns here, and again, I'll put a link um, on, let's see, this side here, we have, I have to see it again, Repetition, how when we see things as repeating. Um, we also have containment, how things are seen as held, um, grouping again, proximity, closure, and continuity. So just some kind of fun visual perception stuff to take a look at. Now, to get a little more into the nuts and bolts, um, there's a concept within Gestalt called the need formation and destruction cycle. Um, so here's an example, and I will walk through it. Um, let's say the organism is at rest, down there, and then they notice the sensation. Um, what is that? A figure of interest arises out of the background into the foreground, and we start to bring that into our awareness. And then in this example, as we're getting to the awareness, I'm like, oh, my stomach is grumbling. I, I must be hungry. So along with that awareness, energy starts to rise an impulse starts to happen and muscle activation starts to take place and we start to move into action. I want to do something and then I'm doing it and so we go to the boundary between us and that other, it could be another person, it could be that food, and we make contact. Now most often this concept is applied to interpersonal dynamics and making contact with other people and sometimes the intensity of that um, can create anxiety at the boundaries. And different people do a lot of different things with the anxiety that they feel when they have interpersonal connections, especially like in social anxiety and stuff like that. Um, so if you're able to make contact, let's say you're able to get that food item and ingest it, you have some resolution and closure, and the primary sensation of grumbling and hunger has been fulfilled, and the energy can go back to rest. Now, along this whole need formation and destruction cycle, there can be like incomplete things that happen. So in relationships with people, um, we might not always make authentic full contact and we can let our anxiety get in the way. Um, so some definitions and examples of anxiety getting in the way are some of these terms right here. So it's a little bit easier to read than some of the other stuff. So first off on the top there, an introjection. 
which I often conceive of as growing up, we take in a belief and without questioning it and come to internalize it without digesting it. And so for one example, it could be I'm, I'm not supposed to have sex. There could be a lot of shame around that. And so you avoid sexual activity, but your organism is a sexual being um, in, in the case of not being asexual. And so those, those sensations of, of libido and being horny will come into your awareness and you'll want to act on them. But then that interject cuts in and says, no, do not act on those. And so you get an incomplete gestalt and that sexual energy, libido can build up and create anxiety and try to come into awareness and we keep pushing it back down and it kind of goes into psychodynamic a little bit if you want to look at it that way. Um, but that's like an example of managing that anxiety at the boundary with an interjection. And so part of the therapy would be uncovering those interjections, bringing them into awareness and digesting them and, and metabolizing them. Um, and then realizing maybe that doesn't apply anymore. Maybe I can have sex and release that pressure and that anxiety. Projection is somewhat of an opposite process where we try to create stories and put them out into the world to explain our interpersonal dynamics. And these stories can get in the way of our actual connection with people. Um, retroflection, an example that I am often told, is let's say you're listening to somebody and they're crying, but instead of comforting them, you will find yourself like massaging your own leg and comforting yourself. So it's turning that desire for action to comfort them back onto yourself for whatever reasons that happens. Um, and deflection can, as it says here, distancing from your feelings and from others using like humor and just kind of deflecting there. And then confluence is where you lose track of your own identity versus the others. And there's this merging and this blurry kind of, you know, it's not authentic contact if you're not still yourself in a certain way. And so I often visualize a lot of this as circles, as bubbles, and kind of coming close to each other, and on the contact continuum, how far away or how close they are to each other. And so wanting to make authentic contact, be in touch with our organismic awareness, and this can lead to more fulfilling and satisfying relationships. Now, I know primarily these videos are about bipolar, and I think there is some important overlap in that people with bipolar can have different states of, you know, maybe you want to conceptualize it as ego. And so my thought is in depression, our ego, our life force, libido can often get contracted and shrink down and want to avoid people, kind of become the distancer and isolate. Um, and we just don't want to deal with the anxiety of connection. So becoming aware of some of the things that we do when we're in a depressive episode to disconnect, we can bring that into awareness and decide it might actually be in my best interest if I can push myself to reconnect and re-engage and have that authentic contact with our caregivers and those that uh, are our friends. And that can help bring us out of that isolation and eventually help decrease some of those depressive symptoms. In contrast, I contend that in hypomanic or especially manic phases that the ego or your kind of bubble becomes fuzzier and bigger and like blurry and energetic and you're like, bouncing all around like a ping pong ball uh, or a pinball on a machine, connecting with people, socializing, losing track of who you are and they are. Um, and as it says, you know, in here with like projection, it can lead to paranoia. Our racing thoughts, you know, can lead to all these stories about what's happening with people and not really knowing and just being so sped up and the pressured speech, like I'm kind of talking now, um, can lead to some issues with authentic contact. So kind of, Another version of this need formation and destruction cycle. Again, we're starting here at the bottom, the organism at rest, the sensation comes into the foreground. And one thing that can happen to block us off from sensing that is don't sense, desensitize. And so a lot of therapy, somatic psychotherapy especially, can be helping you to get back in touch with your body. Um, and that probably definitely happens in, you know, the symptoms of bipolar, getting out of touch with your body, becoming hard to sleep, and so maybe, you know, finding some different body-based approaches to get back to sleep, or even one thing I learned was that if I'm not able to fall asleep while manic, I can at least rest my physical body and just pay attention to that being tired, even if my mind 
brain can't rest. <sighs> Speaking of resting, I'm just going to take another breath. So again, now we have that deflection. Uh, so something is coming into awareness, that need or that impulse, and we're like, oh, I don't know. I can't have that impulse, and I'll just, nope. Um, kind of in a somewhat similar way to the interjection. And they're like, don't feel, don't think, you can't enact that. Um, then the action phase, when we're, we're moving into action, um, that's where we can create that story, don't express, don't act, to kind of fill in the gap there and, and not actually make contact. Some of this can be a little abstract, so it can definitely help to have specific examples, and feel free to chime in in the comments. And then in that final contact differentiating phase, we have the retroflexion, where you can see that arrow that we're uh, turning it back in on ourselves. Don't succeed, don't complete the action. And then let's say we get over to here, we don't allow ourselves to sense, to enjoy um, the completion of the impulse, uh, the egotism, like don't enjoy it. And then perhaps we are enjoying it, we don't want to let go of that. Maybe with the hunger again, like food tastes so good that we don't want to stop eating or something. So coming to terms with the idea that the organism meets its need for hunger and then withdraws from that and perhaps focuses on other sensations that are being ignored and lets those needs arise and then um, dis get destructed, I guess, in, in the terminology of this. So, thank you everyone as I'm burping here and my own body sensations coming to awareness. Thank you for sticking with me and hopefully some of these ideas um, can help and opens up your world a little bit and brings some new ideas into the foreground. Please do feel free to contact me, comment, um, subscribe, and all that jazz, and I think I'll end this video perhaps with a commercial for counseling of some sort, just uh, for some entertainment value and reality value, because I, I have some funny videos and some not. But until next time, take care. Bye.